Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your lives to join us today for another in our series of Saints Talks, short presentations and lectures by leading members of our academic community on subjects that we hope are of general interest. My name is David Williams and I look after the alumni relationship with St Andrews and I'm delighted to welcome you to a special winter festival edition of the Saints Talks. This is a series of winter themed events uh, which included last night a uh, Meet the Author with so-called Queen of Crime Val McDermott which you can view now for a short while on our YouTube channel and coming up on Saturday we have a global quiz for St Andrews alumni, parents and friends at 4pm GMT, which is hosted by Brian Taylor, the BBC's famous Scotland political editor who retired recently, and of course St Andrews alumnus. Alumni, parents and friends are also invited to join the online Christmas service, which will be broadcast from the chapel at 7pm on Sunday. I very much hope you can join St Andrews for one or both of these events this weekend. But today we are looking at the question that in the UK and across those cultures that celebrate Christmas, we are asking with heightened immediacy. As individuals, families, institutions prepare for the Christmas break, what are the implications for the course of the pandemic, both for us as individuals and for society? How does close proximity, celebration, and more especially the social identities we construct for ourselves, our companions, our families, and across society during a festival, change our behavior and our perception of risk? Answering this question, we are delighted to have Stephen Reicher, Professor of Psychology at St Andrews. Professor Reicher advises both the UK and Scottish governments and is one of nine members of the Behavioural Advisory Group of the Independent Sage Body, which gives independent advice to the government and to the public. He also comments regularly in the media on this topic. He has many research interests which inform his expertise, but one of the most pertinent at the moment is his understanding of the construction of social identity which takes place during religious festivals, an area he explored in India. Professor Reicher will talk for about 20 or 25 minutes and then he will take questions afterwards. If you do want to ask a question, you can do so through the Teams taskbar. Uh, please don't put your full name on it as for data protection reasons, I won't be able to publish it. And now over to Professor Reicher. Thank you. Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome back. You really are gluttons for punishment, aren't you? Um, and today I'm going to talk about Christmas. Um, and how to have a safe Christmas. Um, and along the way, I will draw on experiments on sweaty t-shirts and the research that we've done on naked nagasadus to make some points about safety, about behavior, uh, about how we are indeed impacted uh, in terms of our behavior by our social relationships with others. Now, across the four nations, of the United Kingdom, there has now been an agreement that over Christmas, uh, three household bubbles will be allowed to meet. What a bubble means is slightly different in different um, uh, constituent nations of the UK. So it's not exactly the same policy, uh, but it's pretty much the same. And when you ask why was this policy um, uh, implemented, it certainly wasn't implemented on the basis that it is safe for three households to meet. The simple reality of the pandemic is the more that people meet in enclosed spaces, poorly ventilated spaces, crowded spaces, unhygienic spaces, the more the infection will spread. And if people mix in that way over Christmas, inevitably there will be more infections. The argument was very much that people are going to do it anyway, that Christmas is so important to people that people would ignore the rules and therefore it was better to bend a little and therefore keep some control over the situation rather than remain rigid and lead people to just do things anyway and perhaps breaks all bonds of trust between 
the public and the government, something that is severely strained uh, more in some parts of the UK than others. But interestingly, when you look at the evidence, it doesn't quite suggest that picture. This is from YouGov, from YouGov polling, and it suggests that before the announcement was made, no more than a sixth of us had planned to meet up with others at Christmas. And planning something is actually quite significant um, because it indicates far more than just uh, abstract intention that somebody's going to do something. If you ask a clinical psychologist, for instance, about when you should be worried about somebody saying they're going to commit suicide, it's not if they say, life is awful, I'm going to kill myself. It's if they say, I know how I'm going to do it. I know what implement I'm going to use. I know where and when I'm going to do it. So planning is a pretty good indication of what people are going to do. As I say, before the announcement was made, about a sixth of us said that we were planning to have gatherings and uh, irregardless with, uh, with other households. And a clear majority, 56% of us said we are not going to. But the announcement itself changed those plans. And now, uh, if you look, you will find that about a third of people are now planning to meet with others, although it's still a minority. And I think it's important to stress that all the publicity um, uh, acts as if everybody's going to meet up, but not everybody is going to meet up. In fact, a minority are going to meet up. And if you decide you're not going to meet up, there's nothing strange about you. It doesn't mean that you're a Grinch. It doesn't mean that you have no friends. It doesn't mean you don't care, um, nor does it mean you're in the minority. You're in the majority. So the evidence suggests not that the government announcement responded to an intention for everyone to meet up, but it produced that intention. And the question is why? Now, of course, laws and regulations are not just formal uh, prohibitions or formal ways of allowing things. They also are a form of messaging. They send a very strong message. And the danger is that if you send a message that up to three households can meet up at Christmas, you also indicate that perhaps it's safe to do so and that they should. And I think it's very important to stress, and indeed Jason Leach uh, at the uh, First Minister's briefings has regularly stressed, can does not mean should, and nor is it safe. The point is now, the question is not in the hands of the government, it's in the hands of every single one of us. Every single one of us has got a choice. We've got to decide what is best for our families, what is safest for our families. How do we express the Christmas spirit in the time of pandemic? In the midst of the infection, is it best to show love by hugging your elderly relatives or by avoiding hugging them? Now, there is absolutely no doubt that the safest thing to do is to stay apart, to wait for the point when it is safe to meet and to hug and to party and the uh, rollout of the vaccine brings that prospect closer and makes it more real. Um, and therefore, for many families, the decision will be made, we will wait. And perhaps the government could help us, for instance, by announcing an extra public holiday, say on Midsummer's Day next year, so we can all become Australian for a day and we can party on the beach, we can barbecue on the beach. Uh, whether or not we barbecue on the beach, as I say, many people will be making that decision. Other people would decide to meet outside because it's far safer to meet outside. And in fact, 97% of spreader events happen inside. Inside is more dangerous. But some people will look at all the factors together and perhaps because of exceptional circumstances decide, well, actually, it does make sense for us to save, uh, to meet. I perfectly understand that if you have an elderly relative, perhaps a relative who won't be around for many more Christmases, it makes sense to meet this year. In which case, we then need to ask ourselves, what can we do to make the home as safe as possible? And the point I want to stress today is that in many ways there is a paradox. And that is because we think of home as safe, the whole meaning of home, the whole significance of a home 
Is this a place where we can relax? It's a place where we are with people we trust. It's a place that we see as safe. And precisely because of that, precisely because we might relax, we might not take the uh, mitigations as seriously, we might not ventilate as well, we might not uh, clean services as carefully, we might not um, uh, avoid sharing food and drink, we might get closer precisely because of that, the home potentially becomes the most dangerous place of all, not just in horror films, but in terms of infections. And so what I want to talk about for a while is what I'll call the intimacy paradox. That sense that when we're with those and when we're in places that are familiar, and because of that, we think of ourselves as safe, that is precisely where danger lurks. So let me start with sweaty t-shirts. And I'm going to start with an experience which anybody I think in the audience who is a father will identify with. Before I became a father, I thought nappies. I thought I would quite like the child, um, but I thought I'm not going to enjoy cleaning up dirty nappies. Who on earth could not be disgusted by coming into close contact with the feces of another person. And then I had the child and I did quite like him, to tell the truth. I more than quite liked him. And I found that actually nappies didn't bother me at all because this child was part of me. He wasn't other. And because he was part of myself, then wiping his bottom was no more disgusting than wiping my own bottom. It didn't bother me in the slightest. And that sense that perhaps disgust is attenuated when somebody is part of your psychological self made me think about this in collective terms. And to ask the question that when we see somebody as part of a common group, when we share a common group identity with them, do you get similar processes? Do you attenuate that sense of disgust? And so we ran some studies. The studies were very simple. You smell a sweaty T-shirt. Um, we spent a week getting somebody to wear this T-shirt to the gym, then we packed it away, and then we got people to smell this rather revolting article. And it was emblazoned. We had in fact, two, emblazoned either with a St Andrews logo or with a logo of another university, Dundee, in fact. And what we found is that when you smelt the in-group T-shirt, you didn't find it pleasant, but you didn't find it disgusting. You didn't rate it as disgusting. You were much slower in strolling over to wash your hands. You use less soap. You wash your hands for a shorter period. But when you smelt the Dundee T-shirt, identical in every regard but the logo, you found it quite revolting. You could see the looks on people's faces. We got um, raters to rate the disgust on people's faces. You rushed over to wash your hands. You used lots of soaps. You, you washed your hands for a long time. In-groupness attenuated that sense of disgust. If the other was of us, we were less disgusted by them. And incidentally, if you then took people and the participants we used were St Andrews students, I should have said, I think it was implied, but if you got to think them to think of themselves not as St Andrews students, but as students in general, then of course the Dundee students as students become in-group. They become part of the extended in-group and then too, disgust fell. So, in many ways, it is functional to feel disgust at the other. It has been argued, evolutionary psychologists argue, very important to avoid uh, infection. It is equally functional to attenuate disgust for in-group members, because how can you co-act with people? How can you work together with people you find disgusting? It's impossible to do so. So the attenuation of disgust is necessary for in-group coordination. And so it has its advantages, but the dangers it has is that it might expose you more to danger, 
and to infection. If you are less concerned at the uh, the bodily odors, the mod bodily excreta, and so on of other bodies. Now, one implication of that then is we are willing to be physically closer to those who are in group. And indeed, that's what we find in another experiment that I did with a couple of colleagues. And again, a tremendously simple little study. About as easy as you can do, what you do is you take people and you divide them into two groups on trivial grounds. This, you, you flash up a pattern of dots. You get them to estimate how many dots there are, and then you tell them they're either a dot overestimator or underestimator. Actually, you divide them randomly, but they believe they're in these two groups. And the whole point is these groups are trivial. There's no history to these groups. You don't have a, a history of antagonism to the other group. It's just a, a way of pretty minimally dividing people into two groups. And then what you do is you say to people, look, you're going to have a conversation with a member of uh, with another person and that other person is either a fellow dot underestimator or they're a member of the other group they're a dot overestimator so can you please just arrange the chairs so you'll be comfortable and people arrange the chairs so they are about 20 percent closer when the person is in group so we're beginning to see a pattern it's not just with people who are friends not just with uh, our own children but those people we are psychologically closer to, those people we are in group to, those people who we are intimate with and those people we meet in intimate spaces, we lose disgust and we're willing to be closer to physically as well. We put ourselves in greater proximity to them. Now, these are little laboratory experiments. And one might say, well, look, you know, how much weight can we uh, lay on these experiments? And the point of the, about these experiments is to develop theory, but we need to look at whether this theory works in the real world. So one of my colleagues, John Drury, who you saw in a previous paper, uh, uh, a brilliant social psychologist, um, uh, did some work with uh, a PhD student of his who had been a colonel in the Saudi army and one of the people who was responsible for arranging safety at the Hajj, the, uh, the pilgrimage in Mecca, to which uh, every year, not this year, but most years, about three million people go. And occasionally there are dreadful tragedies at the Hajj. 2015, there was a crushing, a stampede and a crushing, as you can see from the headline, over 2000 people died. So it's a very dangerous space. And you would have thought that people would keep apart. But the point is that if you are a pilgrim, what's called a haji, then you have a strong sense of common identity with other hajis. And paradoxically, you feel safer with them. And so when you ask the hajis, they will tell you to the extent they identify with other people, that they are more attractive to the denser spaces. And indeed, they feel safer in the denser spaces because they feel closer to people who they feel are like them and will support them and will help them. So we see this issue of proximity at one, on the one hand, we can see it's a good thing. It leads to intimacy, to closeness, to, uh, uh, to attraction. But on the other hand, especially in certain circumstances, it can be extremely dangerous. It can be deadly in many ways. And of course, in the midst of a pandemic, we know being too close to people, it can also be deadly. Now, I haven't studied directly uh, 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 the Hajj, but I have studied an event which puts the Hajj into the, uh, into the shade. It's sometimes called the greatest show on earth because of its amazing scale. It is the Mela, the Marg Mela, the Hindu festival that takes place every year in the month of Marg, which is January to February, at a very holy site in India, the confluence of the Ganges and Yamuna rivers. And there is a third mythical river, the Saraswati, the river of knowledge. 
um, sometimes Alabad University is seen as the as the uh, manifestation of the Saraswati. So perhaps St Andrews has got a, a hidden river of knowledge which we which we symbolise. But it's an amazing event. So it happens every year, but it's on a 12 year uh, mythical cycle. And every year over the month the people stay there, there are probably around five million people. This amazing mega city grows up. So a bit like Brigadoon, it grows up for a month on the banks, the floodplains of the Ganges. And every six years at the Ard Mela, there are probably up to 10 to 20 million people. And every 12th year, the Kum Mela, the last of which was in 2013, there are up to 100 million people over the month. And on a single day, there are particular days in this month which are particularly auspicious because of the position of the moon. Uh, on particular days, up to 20 million people in one place. I remember in 2013 being on a, a, the small hill near the centre of the Mela and looking and around me was four times the population of Scotland within a couple of miles. It is truly the most amazing event and amazing in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, on these um, auspicious days, just before dawn, there is a parade of the gurus which goes down to the Ganges to, to bathe in the Ganges. Bathing in the Ganges is central to this event. And they are surrounded by renunciants, what are called nagasadhus, who are naked, who are dressed in ash, uh, who are quite ferocious in defending the gurus. In the past, the gurus used to parade down on elephants until there was a stampede of the elephants in the 1950s. Now they're in these, these trucks, which are decorated in amazing ways with coloured glass. And one year, uh, through uh, one of our Indian colleagues, uh, we sat in, uh, in, in one of these trucks uh, with these, uh, the gurus, and the shadows all around us and it will be one of those moments I think that will stick with me until the day that I die. But from a psychological point of view what is interesting about this event is that in almost every way it should be bad for you. By all the lights of psychological research it should be a noxious and unpleasant event. It's insanely crowded and crowding is supposed to be bad for you. It's incredibly noisy. We measured the noise and the noise because there are sound systems from different preachers, from different holy events, from, from just the music, from um, uh, the lost property or lost children announcements coming out. It's a cacophony of a hundred different loudspeakers, tinny and loud. And it's at a level that after 45 minutes, according to WHO guidelines, should cause you distress. And this goes on night and day for a month. So crowded and noisy. And as for the sanitation, well, 20 million people, a rudimentary sewage system. If you do put your foot in the Ganges and you feel something float by, my advice is not to ask what it is. And so you would have thought it would be bad for you. You would have thought that it would be noxious. And I remember we did, we did, we've studied it for many years. We studied, we had a project for three or four years. We had two preliminary grants before that. Um, we did work which included ethnographic research, interview research, observational research, even experimental research. And, 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 and one interview stands out for me. One day we were in the, um, uh, in the camps of the pilgrims who stay for the month, the so-called Kalpvasis. And I said, tell me, what's the experience like? And, and this elderly man looked at me and he said, I want you to go back to your country and to tell people that the Mela, and he used a Hindi word, he used the word Anand to describe it. And it's a word which means bliss. Bliss, in the midst of this cacophony and this crowding, this unhygienic event is bliss. And the question is why? What is it about this religious festival that makes it blissful and indeed serene, another term that is used in circumstances that you would have thought would be precisely the opposite? Well, 
Again, it comes back to these group processes that I've hinted at. So let me spell them out a little bit more. The Kalbvasis very much see each other as a group. They see the others, even if they're complete strangers, as part of a common category of pilgrims with common values and common priorities, common norms. And they experience things you don't experience in your everyday life. The first is, is a concept which is becoming more popular in the social sciences, the concept of recognition. The sense that in so much of our lives, we are treated as if we are invisible by others. People walk past us, they don't incline their bodies even to, to accept our presence. They don't nod at us, they don't smile at us, they don't deviate from their course. They act as if we, at best, we are physical objects, at worst, we're entirely uh, invisible. In the Meller, it's very different. People nod and they smile and they acknowledge each other's presence and they accept each other's presence as, as, as normal and as a good thing. Secondly, in so much of our everyday lives, our understanding of the world, our view of the world is challenged and contradicted by others. If we utter an opinion, you'll get a contrary opinion. If you say something on Twitter, you'll get a hundred trolls telling you you're a fool. Um, if you uh, utter pleasure at your team winning um, at football or rugby or whatever, there will be many who express uh, uh, disappointment or indeed uh, tell you that it was illegitimate it happened. Whereas what Jack Straw many years called ago uh, called our walk on by society where we don't uh, and are not concerned for the ills of other in this context people support each other as I said the the point of the Mela is to devote yourself to to spiritual experience and in particular to bathe in the Ganges four times a day starting before dawn and let me tell you it's cold it's around zero and many of the people are elderly and they are frail and it's a dangerous thing to do, but they feel that they can do this because there are others there to help them. And if they ask for the support for others, they will get it. And that um, you can presuppose that others aren't going to ignore you. They're not going to uh, stand in your way. They're not going to be an impediment. They're going to be a support. And because of this recognition, this validation, this sense of support, you feel empowered. You feel enabled to do the things you couldn't otherwise do. You can express your identity. You can truly be yourself because in so much of the world, you have to behave in ways which are governed by others' values and others' norms. You have to temper what you say. You have to temper what you do. These people will say, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a Hindu and I want to be spiritual, but I've got to dress up for work. Um, if people come round, I can't live a simple life. I've got to give them food. I gossip and so on. In this context, in this context, because we're all together sharing the same values and supporting each other, I am empowered to enact my identity, to truly be myself, my collective self. And that is the root of anand or bliss. Um, we have uh, one paper where we use a slightly different term, effervescence, which Durkheim used to characterize the excitement of the collective. And we argue that that excitement comes precisely from that almost unique sense of agency of being able to be yourself in the collective. Now, one of the consequences of that, one of the consequences of, of, uh, of all this support is it gives people a sense of support in their broader lives. It gives them a sense that others are there for them and not against them. And so it improves health and well-being. We did some longitudinal studies looking at health and well-being before, during and after the um, the Mela, comparing samples of people who went to it and people who didn't go to it. And remarkably, although it's true that the Mela is unhygienic and more people get bugs by going there, for the vast majority who don't get bugs, overall well-being is improved. And hitherto, there was a whole branch of medicine with WHO expert centres around the world on mass gatherings, medicine, the premise being that the Mela and the um, the Hajj and all these other events are a threat 
to health a threat to health precisely by spreading infection. And so the emphasis was on mass gatherings medicine. We argue that yes, there is that negative, but there is also the positive. Actually on the whole, for most people participating in these events, despite all the ways in which you would think they were bad for you, improves health. In a sense, it is a, uh, if you like, it is a, it's a health intervention. It's a, uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about the uh, uh, the forms of non-medical uh, intervention which improve your health, in particular improving social relations. Participating in collective events is one of those. And because of that, this whole movement of mass gatherings medicine renamed itself after a big conference in Saudi Arabia, changing its name from mass gatherings medicine to mass gatherings health. And as I say, it improves in health and well-being both by improving coping and reducing stress because you believe others are there for you, but also in practical terms. Like when people go bathing, that others, if you should slip and fall, they'll be there to help you. If you get ill, they'll go and get medicines for you. So there are very good things for health. And I don't want to give you a one sided view. I don't want you to, to make you think that being part in a group is bad for you. It's good for you in many ways. But there are also negatives because the very positivity and this takes me back to the intimacy paradox, that very sense of joy and bliss and support. Can also endanger health. It endangers health by leading people to forget about the dangers and to take risks and to do things that they shouldn't, to ignore measures to protect their health, to overstretch themselves. People um, at the Hajj often go out and get heat stroke because they're elderly, they're frail, they don't drink enough because they're so excited and they go and get ill. To lose disgust and court infection, quite often what you will find in festivals is people sharing drink and sharing food, even sharing toothbrushes, sharing clothes, sharing masks, why? Because they have the sense that the other is safe. The other can't be a danger to them, so they drop their guard. And what is more, it's not even as if you can talk about the negatives. It's not even if it, it, you can raise problems, because the whole point about the Mela and about a festival is it's all about the positive. And if you invoke the negative, in some sense, you run counter to the norms and to the spirit of the event. So all these dangers, and you can't even talk about those dangers. So I hope that I've explained to you the relevance of sweaty t-shirts and the relevance of Nagasadus and the intimacy paradox. That sense that when we are close to people psychologically, whether because they're family and friends or because they're members of the in-group, there is great joy to it and great positives to it but at the same time, it leads us to behave in ways which are dangerous. Disgust is there for a reason. Disgust is the social ordering dimension. Disgust keeps us uh, distant from things that might be dangerous to us. To lose disgust leads us to do things which might increase the infections uh, that we have. And so now in finishing, um, let me draw this back to Christmas and draw it back to its implications for how we should keep safe. And the first thing I want to raise is, in a sense, the last thing that I said, that difficulty of challenging things, that difficulty of being cautious, that difficulty of invoking the negatives. We did some work with the Scottish government around an issue which you find a lot when you study in uh, social interaction, which is that quite often people do things not because they want to do them, but they don't know how to say no without causing offence. So in the context, for instance, of the, uh, of the pandemic, you meet somebody, you meet an old friend, and they stretch out their hands as if to hug you. Okay. And you don't want to hug them because you don't want to infect them or to get infected by them. But you don't want to be churlish and you don't want to seem unfriendly. And particularly with people you are friendly with, it becomes harder to refuse it, to say no. And so you go along, you hug them. 
Or somebody phones you up and says, I'm feeling really down. It's my birthday. I'm all on my own. Right? And again, because they're a friend, you don't want to be churlish. But at the same time, you don't think it's a good idea to go round because, again, you might infect them. They might infect you. How do you say no? And because saying no, the interactional business of saying no without causing offence, especially to people with whom we are intimate, is difficult, we often go along with it. And so we have worked um, with the Scottish government to produce a, uh, 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 some publicity on what to do. It wasn't, I have to say, it got some bad publicity. Some Conservative councillors didn't like it very much. I think partly um, because it was seen as interfering with how people interact with people, interfering in intimate aspects of our lives where you shouldn't interfere. It's not that at all. It's about helping people to do the things that they want to do. And one of the key things you can do is to reformulate things as offers rather than refusals. You know, um, shall I step away from you a bit just to give you a bit more space and make you a bit safer? Right? You don't say uh, things to people like, I don't want to hug you, or no, I'm not going to hug you. Um, that would be rude and that would put people off. But, you know, if you reformulate things in ways that seem to, to offer, to help, to support, it's possible then much more easily to say no, but in a way that doesn't cause offence. So the simple point here is that actually behaviour and accomplishing behaviour is a complex skill an interactional skill and teaching those skills of how to interact, how to handle awkward in, in their situations. And incidentally, the research showed that well over 80% of people could give you examples of these types of things where it'd been awkward and they'd gone along with things they didn't want to. Um, here, it's, as I say, not a matter of telling what people want to do, but helping them to stay safe. And equally, I would argue that when it comes to Christmas, for those people who do decide that the specific circumstances in their families mean that it makes sense to meet, as I say, perhaps an elderly relative you might not see again, perhaps somebody suffering particularly. Um, for some families, yes, it will make sense uh, to meet. Again, we need to be aware of these dangers. We need to be aware of the intimacy paradox. And we need to plan in advance and think in advance how we're going to behave, how we're going to ventilate our homes to keep them safe, how we're going to organise people, where people sit and where people sleep, so people from house households, different households mix as little as possible, making sure we don't share food from the same pot, making sure we don't uh, share drinks and so on, to be aware of the problem so we can plan for the problem and be as safe as possible. And so let me conclude simply by saying this. Whether you decide to have a virtual Christmas and to delay the hugging and the celebration until next year, made easier, I think, by the prospect of the vaccine, because one of the key factors in adherence to restrictions is your own sense of self-efficacy. Am I able to put up with them and being able to see a finish point enhances that sense of self-efficacy and therefore makes it easier to delay to that self, uh, that uh, safe period. Uh, a bit like if you're going on a long run and you can't see the finish line, sometimes you might think I'm never going to make it, so I'm going to give up. But you see the finish line and think now I believe I can make it, which means you can make it. So as I say, whether you decide to have a virtual Christmas, whether you decide to have an outdoor Christmas and meet and mix with different households outside, which is much, much safer, or whether you decide to meet indoors, understanding the risks, but knowing how to mitigate the risks, let me finish by wishing you all a happy and a safe Christmas break and hopefully a wonderful new year in which we can do all the hugging and all the partying uh, we like uh, and when it will be safe to do so. So I will finish with that. Thanks, uh, Professor Reicher. Um, greatly appreciated. So we're opening up the Q&A now. So if you have any questions for Professor Reicher, please 
enter them uh, in the box. So I've, I've got a, a question to start here, really, which is, um, has there any, been any research done on the effect of indoor festivals on behaviour? Mm. I mean, again, I mean, the, the the processes that I'm talking about, the processes of under conditions of uh, shared identity, you not only get psychological pr proximity, but you get physical proximity as well. Um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, apply everywhere. Um, the other point, of course, which uh, which I didn't mention, and and which uh, which is highly relevant. It's relevant whether you're you know uh, with the family at Christmas, or whether you're in a pub at Christmas, is the role of alcohol and the role of alcohol in disinhibition, and and that of course uh, increases the dangers of people forgetting about restrictions, uh, people forgetting about distance, uh, for people beginning, for instance, to share things from the same bottle uh, and, and so on. So I think um, there are added dangers, uh, especially uh, if, if, uh, if, if alcohol and other intoxicants are involved in, in any sort of celebration. OK, thank you. Um Got an anonymous question here. Uh, fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, how do you recommend we welcome back our student offspring for Christmas? No grandparents mm. involved. Mm. Well, I think I mean there there are a whole series of things that that can be done to make to make things safer. I mean, if one is seeing elderly relatives, the more that you can isolate before seeing them, uh, the better. Um, and uh, you know, uh, ten to twelve days should be enough. So it, it would make sense to minimise interactions uh, before you see elderly, uh, any elderly relatives, if you're going to do so. Um, uh, of course, uh, in terms of students coming home, hopefully they will have been tested, and hopefully those tests will have been uh, negative. But again, I think uh, you know we've got to be clear that the, 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 the tests are not a sign of immunity. They just tell you what's happening at a particular state uh, point in time. So again, I think uh, it means a certain level of caution uh, has got to be uh, exercised uh, at, 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 at all levels. And that includes all the things I've talked about. Um, one of the points that, I, that, that I've stressed is ventilation, um, especially when you're mixing households. And ventilation seems to be more and more important because it does seem as if aerosol transmission is critical and um, aerosols uh, hang around in the air unless there is good ventilation from the outside which circulates air and leads them to go outside. Now, of course, one of the problems there is um, you need to keep warm at, uh, at, at Christmas and to keep your house warm and to keep the windows open literally means money out of the window. And one of the things I've been suggesting without much success, but I, I will try once more, um, is <coughs> in the same way that we have a winter fuel allowance, it would seem to me to be sensible to have a pandemic fuel allowance, which would then uh, allow every family, even poorer families, uh, to be well ventilated and to stay warm. What is more, it would be a way in which the government signals that it is aware of the difficulties for families. It's no good simply to give advice and tell people to do things which aren't practical for them, because all that does is it indicates to people that you don't understand how they live and therefore further undermines your relationship with them and further undermines trust and influence. It becomes highly counterproductive. So I think it's very important, and this goes back to my first talk, that as well as giving people uh, advice, as well as telling them what to do, uh, government very much needs to think about how it can support people to do the right thing and support people to stay safe. Um, because as I say, just um, uh, lecturing at people or preaching at people and indicating your distance from their realities is highly counterproductive. So, so we have another anonymous question, uh, understandably anonymous actually, wondering uh, now whether to try and be just a bit more obnoxious to family over Christmas in order to top up and maintain their disgust responses 
towards <laughs> at some distance, tongue in cheek. Uh, but should we be vigilant in that way? For me, you know, sometimes I have a sense when I when I do media things that I'm being set up um, precisely as the Grinch uh, that stole Christmas. To me, it's not a matter of changing Christmas or being less loving to your family. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about what does that mean in a uh, in a time of pandemic? How do we best express that love for our family? And it, in many ways, it's more difficult not to hug our family than to uh, hug our family. And in many ways, uh, it's more difficult uh, not to spend time with them than to spend time with them. But indeed, it's precisely a sign of love that you're prepared to do that for each other's well-being. Um, so my first point would be that I'm not suggesting that anybody is unpleasant to others or anybody shows less love for others. I'm asking, what does that mean in this context? And in fact, actually, if you look at religious teachings, I've, we've been doing some work um, with the Muslim community about uh, the impact of the pandemic on, on, on their lives. And it's quite interesting looking at um, uh, their responses around Eid and Ramadan. And let's not forget that when people say, oh, look, everyone's going to meet up, you can't stop people meeting up. Actually, although Eid was, uh, in a sense, cancelled the night before in the Northwest, actually, by and large, Muslim families went along with that. They showed that resilience. And one of the things they did was to find different ways of expressing uh, you know, the, the Muslim teachings around Eid and Ramadan and looking after others. So, for instance, because people couldn't um, um, uh, cook large meals for their family and care for their family, they st still did the cooking. They still showed the care, but then they distributed the food amongst the needy, amongst food banks, amongst their neighbours and so on. So to me, it's about showing creativity and showing imagination and asking ourselves well what does what do what do the values and what are the norms and 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 what does the sense of caring for family mean in this particular uh context and uh, as i say it's not about being negative it's about um, displaying love in different ways in a different context Uh, so, so the anonymous questioner has responded, say that uh, he or she agrees. Uh, I was the questioner. I'm a psychologist, so I'm fascinated by the research implications here, as well as loving my wider family. Um, so we're, we're reassured by that. Um, <laughs> interesting question on the vaccine. We're talking about the, the 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 vaccine offering people hope because they can get through to that point. But the another anonymous question, do you think that now the vaccine is being administered, that people will be more relaxed and adhere less to social distancing over the holiday period? That's a very good question. It gets asked a lot. Um, and I do think it depends very much on the messaging. I think one of the biggest mistakes that was made in the whole pandemic was made in, uh, well, precisely on July the 4th. The decision was made to relax restrictions on July the 4th. And I think that was done knowingly in order to get headlines like Independence Day, Freedom Day, Super Saturday and so on. And that messaging sent a very strong um, message to people that, OK, that uh, yeah, we're now free. We can now dispense with those uh, uh, restrictions and that people can relax. And I think uh, in many ways that stopped us driving the levels of infection down um, and therefore led to the spikes in, in infection we had when conditions got worse in the autumn um, and in the winter and therefore uh, the restrictions we see ourselves in now. So I think give, declaring premature victory is always a problem. And I think talking about yesterday as V-Day was profoundly unhelpful in that regard, because, of course, the resonances were with uh, uh, with the wars um, and the V. I mean, of course, on, on the one hand, it means vaccine, but also it implies victory. Well, one can look historically. If you go back to the Swan, uh, Spanish flu pandemic uh, at the end of the First World War, actually the armistice, and the celebrations around the armistice 
um, actually led to a huge spike in infections and many, many more people uh, died. So if you do declare victory and if you do relax, the danger is, well, first of all, that people will tragically die just before the uh, the vaccine is available. But secondly, if we have spikes in infection, it will, of course, tax the NHS. It might overwhelm the NHS and make it more difficult to roll out the vaccine itself. So I think the, the messaging is absolutely critical. And I think it's really important to give people hope without hype. Uh, really important to say to people, look, there's a way forward now. Perhaps the finish line is in sight, but we are certainly not there yet. And so I do think there is a need to be very, very careful in the messaging because the messaging will determine whether the existence of the vaccine leads us to, in a sense, uh, maintain our efforts, knowing now that we have the, uh, the resilience to get to the end or will lead people to relax, believing that the threat is in effect over. Um, at the very least, everyone's got to understand that the vaccine does not have any impact on the level of infections we're going to have over the Christmas period, because, of course, you've got to take two uh, doses, three to four weeks apart, and then uh, maximum uh, immunity happens about a week to 14 days after that. So it's a month to a month and a half before the vaccine can do anything at all. And that doesn't cover the, winter, uh, the, the, the Christmas period. And if, if every household meets with two other households, then there will be a, a huge spike in infections. And, you know, uh, the celebrations in uh, uh, over Christmas will sadly lead to mourning in the new year. And we've got to be aware of that. And we've got, therefore, uh, to make those decisions about safety very, very carefully, thinking very carefully about the implications for ourselves, as I say, for our families and for the community at large. Thank you, Professor Anker. I'm going to ask a, a final question now from, from Sharon in Japan uh, on mask wearing and, and mask wearing around family. Uh, thank you. Great talk. In Japan, we are told to wear a mask when we go into another person's house. We are also told not to talk when we eat, not to eat facing someone, and after eating to put the mask back on. While the latter three things may be difficult in the UK during Christmas dinner, do you have any idea why the Scottish Government doesn't recommend wearing a mask during Christmas celebrations when not eating? Mm. Well, I think one of the things that is, <coughs> um, we, we have to be very sensitive to. Um, and I, I mentioned this when I was talking about the uh, the campaign we're involved in, is I think there is a, a very strong sense that it is not the role of government to interfere in the domestic sphere. It's seen as a step too far. The government can tell us all sorts of things and tell, tell us what to do. It can't tell us what to do in our own homes. And I think it would be counterproductive to say to people, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. And so I think it's really important to make clear that you know, what, what, what I've been talking about is not about telling people what to do. <coughs> it's about helping people make their own decisions about what is safest for them and their families. Um, that it's, it's there, as I say, to enable them to make decisions for themselves rather than to take decisions uh, away from people. And so I think the way forward is to be as clear as possible about the risks. That's why I, I, I entitled this talk, Can Doesn't Mean Should. And I think there is a real danger that the announcement about uh, Christmas uh, bubbles says to people, look, uh, not only can you do this, but it's fine, it's okay to do it, and it's safe to do it. We've got to recognise that there are risks. There are risks from meeting in the house. There are risks from not taking the mitigations. There are risks from not opening the windows. There are risks from um, from wearing masks. And, and, and people have got to understand that and then make those calculations for themselves. Now, every family circumstance will be different. And I do accept um, there will be, um, for a number of families, looking squarely at all the evidence in the face um, that for them it makes sense to meet up. 
I think on the whole, however, that's a minority. I think for the ma great majority, it makes far, far more sense just to wait a little. It's a little bit like, you know, if you're crossing the road, well, you know, if, if there's an emergency going on the other uh, on, on the other side, then occasionally it might make sense to cross that road with traffic coming both ways, but it's pretty rare to do it. For the vast majority of people, it makes far more sense um, not to cross the road uh, until traffic isn't coming both ways. And so in a situation when it's safe, um, then, you know, then we can wait. And I just want to finish with this. Um, as, a, as, a, as a boy, I was always obsessed by the horror of the First World War. Um, and one of the things that always stuck in my mind, and I've been reading about it recently as well, one of the things that stuck in my mind was the fact that between the time when the armistice was announced at five o'clock in the morning on the 11th of September, and when the armistice came into uh, force at 11 o'clock, the war continued and tens of thousands of casualties were taken in that period. Many thousands of people were killed in that period. In one particular event, American troops sought to cross the River Meuse in, in northern France and were mown down by machine guns when an hour or two later, they could have simply walked across and been completely safe. And that loss of life seems all the more tragic and all the more poignant for the for the fact that they, as I say, they could have waited for just a few hours. Now, we're not quite in the same position, but still, I think we're in a position now where we can do the things we want in the not too distant future completely safely. And just think how you would feel if, you have the celebration, but you get infected, or somebody you know gets infected. And I, you know, for, of course, one hopes it won't happen to anyone we know, but or, or somebody gets hospitalized or somebody dies. It will be so pointless to do that. And so I think the role of government at this point, because the decision has been made about mixing, the point about government is to give us the information we need and make completely clear to us the dangers and allow us then to make the decision about what is safest for us at Christmas. So I, I, I'm not here to dictate and, and I'm not here uh, to steal Christmas. I'm here, I hope, to use my knowledge and my academic expertise to alert people to the dangers and to what they need to do in order to stay safe. I've lost sound. I can't I can't hear you. In fact, you're muted. Apologies. Um, thank <laughs> you, Professor, and thank you. Um, well, I had some announcements um, uh, to the alumni and, and parent and, and supportive community about other events coming up. Uh, those can be checked on social media. But I think the profundity of your observation about the First World War and the armistice and the people who died just before uh, the hell of the war ended. I think that's such a profound observation. I think I'd like to leave the audience with that for the moment and just thank you again for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us all. Thank you. Thanks.